Hi, I'm Tom Waldrop from Red Hat. I lead the global TME practice at Red Hat. And with me today are uh, Steve Rose from IBM, uh, Patrick Lopez from NEC. Hello. And Gaurav Sagal from Tech Mahendra. Hi, everyone. All right. Hey, hi, guys. Um, we are going to unpack a worthy topic today, accelerating and operationalizing your 5G deployment with rapid integration. And I hope as we go through this that we can be uh, uh, we can be a little bit informal and uh, and have a little bit of fun with the topic. Uh, it is a really, really big topic. Um, you know, we learned from um, the last, I'd say, five to ten years now of um, moving network functions to virtualized clouds, that the activity of decomposing traditional network services and then recomposing them into cloud uh, comes with um, comes with a lot of operational um, and integration and testing issues that um, had been previously solved for us by the network equipment providers for the last 35 to 40 years. Um, and what we did is we implemented uh, largely waterfall deployment practices consistent with how we've done things for years. Um, we thought we were doing that um, with really good reason and rational thought. Um, because we have literally 50 plus years of experience in managing carrier grade networks a certain way. We know it works. Um, and uh, so we, we replicated that. We replicated waterfall. Most, uh, most of us continue to deal with annual engineering releases at best. Um, but as we got into it, we realized we were deploying on a cloud platform that really was only intended to deliver three and a half nines. Um, that the software that we were using for network services um, needed to take on greater responsibility for its own um, availability. Uh, and we did all this on platforms that typically had life cycles of, you know, five plus years um, before we would have to perform, um, you know, complete replacements or refreshes. Um, as we look at what's going on with 5G, there is a significant move in the industry from virtualization to Kubernetes. Uh, and Kubernetes is uh, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting open source project. Uh, in any given 18 month period, as much as 90% of the code in the entire project will fundamentally change. Uh, so the notion that we can have an open source um, Kubernetes based platform and have the same kind of long life cycles without significant upgrade or refresh um, is, is really unrealistic. Um, it becomes prohibitively expensive and complex even to maintain uh, security patches uh, by the time we get to about month 18 uh, in any given release. So all of the pressures that we've felt uh, in deployment, in operationalization, um, and in management of network services on cloud platforms, they're, they're, they're amplified due to um, this very dynamic um, platform that we we all agree makes sense to use but comes with some operational um, some new operational requirements so um, with that as a backdrop uh, I'd like us to just unpack uh, this notion of how do we accelerate this and how do we accelerate it on a on a cloud platform that really does require a different way of management a different way of deployment a different way of um, thinking even different culture. Um, so um, let's just move into some questions and, and see where this takes us. Um, so first question I'd like us to, to tackle is, where do we think the industry is in their journey with, with 5G? 
you know, is anyone at scale? Uh, and do we see best practices emerging uh, within the provider community that center uh, around how we, you know, how do we hybridize the old and the new from an operational process point of view? And I'll go to Steve Rose first. Yeah, no, I, well, I think we are making progress. I mean, I mean, I think the industry has a tendency to, to, you know, sort of flog itself with the lack of progress and whatnot. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of down downbeat messaging out there but actually i think you know if you can you compare where we were three years ago just in turn of in terms of the attitude of the of the equipment vendors the nokias and the ericsson's and you know those of this world um to even embrace the notion of of virtualization and 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 kubernetes i think you know we've come a long way forward in that discussion um it it, it does mean significant changes through the value chain i also think that the um service providers have really started to understand that this is a leadership problem on their organization. And it starts with a leadership problem because ultimately you are, it's, you know, seeking cultural change and that cultural change really manifests in how do you actually first off innovate different services. So actually there needs to be a level of education and change management because you need to think about um, what are the types of problems and services that the um, that the network is going to provide in the future, and then, and then, to what extent does that change the way in which operational workflows and decisions actually happen happen in the network? Um, and then, more than that, what are the skill sets that evolve so that you can actually understand not only what is the technical benefit or what is the technical status inside of the network anywhere at any one moment in time, but where do you think about putting different workloads? Uh, relative to the uh, type of performance demand that is actually going to be on the cloud. So you know, there are a number of different areas. And I think um, we we thought about it a few years ago and thought, well, the easiest way is you stick everything onto public cloud and then people start to realize that isn't the case. I think universally, as far as I'm seeing right now, hybrid cloud seems to be the way that people have decided for that. But then they're starting to come to terms with, well, what is the different types of workloads? What are the techno-economic benefits between those different uh, cloud environment. So, so I think we're a long way forward. I think it's 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 progressing well. Could it be faster? Sure, of course. You know, we'd always prefer it to be faster, but I think we are definitely making solid progress. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let's go to Patrick. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's been a few hundred you know, 5G networks deployed at scale. Uh, so there's no question that 5G is progressing well. Um, and it's progressing at scale. Uh, but I think what many people don't necessarily see is that there is not one of 5G. There are different flavors of, of 5G and there are different type of workload. Um, many operators have deployed 5G uh, non-standalone, which is basically an evolution of 4G really. Um, and what that means is that in many cases, um, they still deployed appliances, and when there is some level of virtualization, it's more around virtual machines uh, and environment that are not necessarily cloud native by themselves. Um, what we are seeing now uh, with uh, a number of new network functions uh, that have been developed more recently, let's say, uh, is really the introduction of cloud native environment within these brownfields. Um, that is a hybrid between uh, appliances, proprietary vertical systems, uh, virtualization based on virtual machines and uh, an FVI. And now we starting to see, as you mentioned, Tom, uh, Kubernetes um, uh, and even, even microservices based architecture uh, for uh, 5G. Um, and we see that in a number of different domain. Uh, in the core domain, we see that in uh, uh, 5G standalone core networks. We see that in the access even, um, and Open Run is probably one of the network function that is uh, deployed the most in a cloud native environment. And for operators, um, uh, as mentioned, there is a transition that is necessary, uh, a transition in terms of understanding the new technology, understanding how that technology integrate within their brownfield environment, um, and more importantly, understanding how um, their organization, uh, their operational model, 
and their processes need to evolve in order to be able to grasp and make the most of those different hybrid implementations. Um, and as discussed, I mean, we've seen uh, implementation that have been public cloud based, uh, but in the large majority operators have understood that um, there's a gradation of network function. Uh, and some network function are well uh, suited to be living uh, in a public cloud environment. Other need to remain on premise uh, in a private cloud, um, either due to uh, uh, requirements of performance, uh, of latency, or privacy. Um, and that forces operators to basically have that approach where they need to decide what function should live should live where, um, and how to transition from one environment to the other in an harmonious fashion. And uh, Gaurav, last but not least. Right. Thanks, Thomas. I think uh, let's get a little. So let's just give you perspective. Okay. So we have to understand that five G is not about the uh, MBB or mobile broadband use case, uh, but it's about transforming business, industries, and society at large. Now, this obviously needs a holistic shift in technology, skills, and people mindset, and that needs time. I personally believe that there has been a huge adoption of 5G across, across the different regions, uh, North America definitely being the front runner. And I also believe that Asia will definitely take 5G in a much more faster way with India being one of the leaders in that sense. For example, it took about five years from moving from 3G to 4G in Asia. From 4G to 5G, it might be less than two years. But the key emerging trends uh, which are coming in this region predominantly is that NSA definitely leads the, leads the whole thing. The, the pure SA deployments definitely is taking a bit more time because of various reasons. The, it needs a whole shift of technology. Uh, the complete tooling architecture needs to be changed. The complete open, openness in terms of the cloud native architecture needs to be adopted. The shift between whether to keep a certain workload on on-prem or maybe on a hyperscaler based architecture. That's something which are in discussions and different operators are testing it. I see too many trials happening with different workloads globally, and especially in Europe as well. When somebody wants to test, let's say, an, an AMF or an NRF or a GCP or AWS and also an OpenShift, those kind of things are really happening globally. Uh, in my view, uh, one of the key aspects of the faster adaption of 5G S in particular is going to be around network automation. How well will you bring the automation layer on top to really integrate the multi-vendor technology? The multi-vendor domains is something will really see the success of 5G adoption in the near term. And I see all these operators bringing a lot of tools, maybe from third partners or bringing in-house. For example, there are operators working on ONAP-based SMOs themselves. There are operators who are kind of bringing in the third party tools to really test these automation layers uh, to, to really see the right level of orchestration, the right level of service assurance, the right level of, I would say, observability in the network. But these are real elements and real tenants to really see if 5G really will make a lot of difference to the, the life of a normal citizen who really wants to see a better use case for improving their lifestyles or maybe an industry vertical like automotive or manufacturing who probably want to see private 5G now the next norm, uh, making a difference to their fleet management, to their supply chain use cases. I think it's a mix of too many things. Uh, I, I would say never in our lifetimes we would have seen so much of so much of disruption in terms of technology change, people mindset change, cultural change. So this is something which is very phenomenal and it's going to really take a lot of time. Having said that, things are moving really quick. And I think everybody on the supply and demand side are really making it happen to ensure that the 5G adoption really becomes uh, the need of the hour for us. All right, thank you, Gaurav. So I'm hearing that uh, the industry is making progress. Uh, I think I heard all of you um, mention in one form or another the importance of, um, of leadership and cultural change. Uh, I heard you know, the importance of um, evaluating and planning the right place for workloads to live, the coexistence of um, uh, new capabilities um, with uh, existing environments, brownfield environments. Um, you know, it, it, it really um, uh, it seems to support a, you know, a, a concern that I've had now for a while that uh, when we deploy 
a 5G network, uh, whether it be core, RAN, or any of the supporting functions, uh, that it's as important to consider um, the operational architecture uh, and the associated culture changes and processes as it is to uh, to consider the technical architecture that's initially being deployed. So in that context, you know, how important are concepts like continuous integration, continuous testing, and continuous delivery to immediate term and long-term success here? And what do the providers have to do um, in order to uh, uh, to bring this into their environment when when they're codified in ITIL and ETOM uh, sorts of practices, which on the surface seem to be toxic with these these fail first DevOps concepts. Uh, and we'll mix it up. We'll go to uh, Patrick first this time. It's interesting because in networks, um, you see very few greenfield, very few greenfield networks, very free, few greenfield environments. I think right now, like the only greenfield networks that we can think of at scale, there's one in Japan, one in Europe, one in the US, basically, we all know the names. Um, and NEC is involved in most of them. Um, the, um, the deployment model and the operational model is um, somewhat simpler because you start from scratch <laughs> and you can start uh, with a cloud native environment. Uh, the difficulty for the brownfield environments uh, is that um, you have to create islands of cloud native inside that brownfield um, uh, environment, uh, which means that you have to create also uh, teams of cloud native capabilities without within uh, the traditional operational teams. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, CI/CD CT. Um, I think we receive a tremendous amount of requests uh, to support those type of processes in network operators. Uh, but we're still very early in the sense that, you know, traditional uh, wisdom would say that introducing a new vendor in a telecom environment is about $50 million. Uh, making a change in a telecom network is probably about, and when I say a change, it could be just a change of configuration or setting. It's like 18 to 24 months and three to $5 million. That's, that's the rule because if you have to run a network uh, that is going to carry uh, not only business critical, but also infrastructure critical environment and that you are uh, requested by regulatory environment to be able to provide emergency services, no matter the level of emergency, then you have a whole organization that has been designed for things not to break. Um, and the best way for things not to break is not to change them, uh, uh, which is on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, from cloud native and for environment and CICD city. Having said that, large majority of operators understand that um, here again, there has to be a filter uh, and there has to be uh, a conscious decision of what is critical infrastructure and rema must remain uh, completely impervious to change. And what are the functions that can allow some change or even frequent change in order to adapt to different needs from customers? And, and the key of 5G, the promise of 5G is that you're going to be able to create connectivity services that are going to be different for different type of verticals, different type of enterprise, different type of use cases. And well, you know, that already exists in the cloud environment. It's not something new, uh, but it will be something new in telecoms because in telecoms, you build a network and everybody got the same service. Um, so trying to bring those two ideas together. And if we understand that this is kind of the premise for the business case of 5G, operators understand that they cannot continue basically assembling and running network the good old way with proprietary appliances that have very long cycles of changes. So we're seeing 
basically the introduction of CICD CT together with the introduction of cloud native environment and their islands of cloud native within the deployment. And I mean, examples that we've seen are in open RAN. Uh, we have seen them also in uh, 5G standalone uh, core. We see them in open transport. Uh, these are all, let's say, opportunities for operators to not only deploy, but really learn and upscale their capabilities to eventually being able to transform their network at scale. And that transformation is going to be what will enable them to offer enterprises, governments, verticals, those differentiated services that I was mentioning. All right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, let's go to Gaurav. Yeah, Thomas, so in my view, uh, it's like building a fancy car without wheels, right? So you may have the best 5G network deployment, but if you don't have a great operations platform in the name of CI, CD, CT, it's not going to scale and get the desired results. So just imagine having to do so many updates and upgrades in the old traditional world. You may do an upgrade once in every two years, once a year. With the cloud native architecture, it might become a weekly or a monthly affair. And you cannot run these kind of open networks, heterogeneous environments, multi-domain, multi-technology without having a strong pipeline and DevOps way of deploying and doing the lifecycle management. So to our knowledge, this is the, this is the most pivotal aspect of how 5G will get further adapted and how fast 5G can really make a difference to the real life world. Now, because up to 4G, networks were being built only as a full stack and all the NEPs and OEM just came that I will deliver to you. I will do the end-to-end -end SLA management KPI and give you the end-to-end -end 999 service which you need. But in the, in, the, in the era of 5G, I believe it's the other way around. All the operators, CTO and CNOs have started to look at the operations element first how do they have a very unified CI CD platform, which is multi vendor agnostic? And then they should be building up their networks backwards and not the other way around, because the success of any 5G for different use cases, be it the enterprise use case or a B2C use case, will, will depend upon how strong is your upgrade and lifecycle platform, which is being built either in house or by any vendors like us. So, keeping that in mind, uh, TechM actually launched a product called NetOps.ai, we built it a pure open source cloud native Kubernetes based architecture, and it works, works seamlessly on Hyperscaler and on even OpenShift uh, many, many years ago, because we felt that this is the need of the hour and all the operators will have to go in this direction, building their own uh, unified LCM platforms, which are really going to help them do the lifecycle management of different VNFs to CNFs, to upgrades, to updates, to self healing networks and also giving the right level of service assurance you may need to run your networks. So in our mind, this is one of the most critical aspects of building your 5G networks in the days, in the days to come. Thanks, Gaurav. And uh, let's go to Steve. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the previous two really captured most of what was actually being, you know, sort of the problems that, that we need to solve for. But I mean, for me, it's it's I would try to bring it down to something quite practical i mean you have if you want to have multiple vendors in the network then one of the first challenges is you have to have a common reference architecture in which everybody is willing to pivot towards because otherwise you will have um a lot of different technologies trying to compete with each other and there'll be a lack of harmony or there'll be a lack be very very difficult to orchestrate i think that's problem number one and i think that also goes back into then common ways of working even within an oem depending on the products that you actually have you might experience different care environments those care environments bring different tools different processes um, so there's a lot of problems actually just even dealing with a singular oem to try to get them to harmonize their ways of working imagine then you've got to try to do that across multiple OEMs. and so one of the practices that you know that i've, I've, I've seen and, and i think dish have, have heralded this in, in 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 many respects is to try to bring the oems into a common working environment and actually get them to recognize that, you know, commonality between them in terms of just ways of working is a critical part to that. I think there are another, another couple of critical issues. One is just making sure that then um, there is a stronger uh, um, push towards software quality. I think that's gonna be key because obviously if there is less focus on also on software quality or if there are issues around software software quality that's going to drive the number of updates and upgrades which is then going to complicate 
the number of, of, of testing environments that you're going to have to be able to run concurrently or, 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 or testing missions that you're going to have to run um, concurrently. And then the last bit within that as well, of course, is understanding the interdependency between different types of technologies and CNFs, NFs, PNFs. Those things actually become very, very complicated at one point in time. So trying to actually compartmentalize testing environments, making sure that you interrogate uh, the service uh, with a with a robust um, uh, uh, testing environment is going to be absolutely critical so that before it goes live, of course, you actually understand things like what is the blast radius of particular or the potential for blast radius uh, within you know any particular issues that you've got and then continuously doing that. So we talk about I, I think we talk about t- continuous integration and delivery, but I think the testing is really the critical component of that. That almost needs to be somehow um, a daily exercise that you're you're randomly pushing into the network so you can figure out problems before they become service affecting. Thanks, Steve. So I heard um, that, you know, these cloud native um, activities that are going on now are uh, are islands of capability. I'm going to take a little bit of license and say they're, they're islands of capability that are captive inside of a broader legacy operational function. Um, I've heard, uh, I heard that it's absolutely critical that we have these CI, CD, CT uh, types of capabilities in order to ever achieve scale. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think Steve's point about the critical importance of uh, of managing the um, the OEMs, managing the the suppliers of all of the componentry that goes towards uh, bringing these five G network services to life and and uh, bringing them together on a common platform becomes critical. Um, so it, it 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 kind of brings to mind then you know this is this is pretty fundamentally different um you know if if we have to do all of these things we have to do it in a way that feels a little bit like a revolution because it's moving so fast as opposed to an evolution um we have to figure out how to replicate um productized capabilities in a cloud native environment um, how would you net out you know the difference between simply deploying um, a network platform a cloud platform versus actually productizing a set of network services um, such that you know, if you if you have a five G network, you you know it works because you can actually make a phone call or move data around between two mobile handsets. Uh, and on this, I'll go to Gaurav first this time. Okay, Thomas. So, in, in my view, uh, you know, most of the uh, the work which is going to happen between now and next twelve months, it has to be prioritized. And the approach uh, which we should take as a, as industry is to have everything which is unified and platform centric, uh, because the missing and the kind of components which are going to integrate uh, in the 5G world, uh, multi-vendor, multi-technology, and also the domains, so many domains coming up. You have ORAN, you have the core, you may also have the transmission SDN, you may have the different use cases, asking for different level of resourcing at, at any point of time. The approach has to be platform-centric. We cannot have an open approach which does not give you a sense of reusability if you want to launch a new service. Can I use a use case which has 70% reusable to a second use case and replicators across multiple use cases because you cannot build your network specific to a use case and change the whole genre and move to a second use case which might be B2B or B2C. So in my view, it has to be, the networks has to be built from now on in such a fashion that it has to have a resonance with different requirements with a 70% reusability and 30% customization which is required for that particular use case or a business requirement or a service requirement. The moment you start building it in a different linear way, I, I, my, my sense is that we will lose the plot as an industry and we need to really figure out what is the right platform, right a network cloud uh, you know, to, be, to, be, to be adopted or maybe an application to be taken into consideration. All this has to be considered now, now, so that you're able to build a network of the future. Thanks, Rob. Let's go to Patrick. Um, 
Oh, let's make it fun. I'll disagree a little bit. <laughs> uh, I think um, I think one of the driver in telecom to reduce uh, risk has been to try to find um, uh, one size fit all kind of solution. Um, and I think little by little, this is failing. Um, in the sense that you're seeing use cases that have so much variability and so much dispersion that it's going to be very difficult to build a network that's able to accommodate all those use cases simultaneously. Um, what that means is that, from my perspective, you're going to see, so, you know, in telecoms, we're talking about slices, but the reality is is probably that we're going to see networks that have several cores uh, and those cores might be specialized for different use cases, for different geographies, uh, for different needs. And they might be transient as well. They might not live for a very long time. Uh, and the telecom network were architected with basically until now a single core that was managing all the traffic all centrally. Uh, and that was okay because everyone's traffic was essentially the same. Uh, but as we're going to see uh, traffic from uh, drones that will differ from tra traffic from connected cars, that will differ from traffic from printers, that will differ from traffic from collaborative robots, um, well, they intuitively we understand that all those different use cases and devices have different needs from the network. Um, and having all those different needs satisfied simultaneously at scale of a complete network is probably not going to be um, efficient in the sense that you will have to oversubscribe the entire network tremendously in order to enable all those use cases all the time. Uh, by contrast, uh, I think that we're starting to see uh, basically, uh, well, heterogeneous network capability being built within the fabric of the network. Um, and that is due well, essentially to the advance in cloud native. Because in the past, if you wanted to do that, well, you had to physically move like a server from one location to another, plug it, uh, bring it up and manually provision it. Now, if you have built a cloud native net, uh, fabric throughout the network, you can actually provision those capabilities uh, automatically, even if you use uh, AIML, uh, predictively, um, and automation becomes a tool that allows you to cheat. Uh, and when I say cheat, I mean create those different services capabilities that have very different uh, demand on the network simultaneously, but not at the scale of the whole network, as needed, when needed, where needed. Um, and I think um, what that means also is that we have to resist thinking that there is one network architecture and one capability that will enable all of that. It's a discrete suite of different capabilities. Um, and at NEC, what the way we've been looking at it and the way we've been trying to enable it is uh, by embracing um, open and disaggregation uh, network. Uh, so open and disaggregated network is the systematic use of open API, the systematic use of cloud native uh, principle, and the systematic use of uh, AI native capabilities that allow the instrumentation, the automation, uh, and the orchestration of those workloads to be provisioned on demand as needed. Uh, so we think that at a high level, uh, the success of 5G depends on many of these arti artifacts. All right, thank you, Patrick, and uh, now to Steve. Yeah, I'm, I, again, I mean, I think covered a lot of topics in there, but I think you know, of of course, the the as the industry progresses towards disaggregated architecture, one of the things that we will see is increasingly the AI and, and the intelligence, the decision making about how experience is actually delivered to the to the to the end device, whatever that end device actually is, um, will continuously go further and further out to the user plane and to the edge. So I think that's that's a critical component. And I think if you actually see, you know, critical components of the architecture, like the rig, for example, that will be 
also on 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 the control plane there where we will start to see uh, a, a lot more intelligence coming in and and it's also by the way um uh, well, one of the reasons why it's of paramount importance that we actually have more innovation, more o- openness in the, in the networks is that we will drive um, applications into those uh, particular elements of the architecture that would enable the network to deliver unique and, 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 and um, differentiated experience at, at scale. And I think from a practical standpoint, that also means then that in the, in the operations center, um, templatizing for some of these you know, different characteristics of service is going to be absolutely key as well. Um, so instead of actually, you know, having one size fits all, of course, service, we will have um, slices or we have ca- characteristics of service that will be made up of, you know, whatever it happens to be, latency, availability, throughput, you name it, all of those characteristics of service. And then once you've got those um, uh, characteristics of service effectively loaded up where you actually understand what key processes um, or what key services those those um, characteristics will support, then the NOC engineers will be able to then uh, uh, build AI and controls in such a way that they'll be able to you know, load them into different parts and unique parts of the network. Um, and that way, then you you don't have to over provision uh, for for all of the uh, of the network all of the time. So you know there are some real critical um, um, uh, architectural considerations, but but also the tooling environment and the way that you can actually set up these environments is going to be absolutely critical as well. I'll go one step further, if you'll allow me. I think that one important aspect of it, and I think one possible key success criteria for network operators will be the ability to enable uh, slicing as a service. Um, And what I mean by that is um, it's more likely that you know, Mercedes or Magna will create a successful automotive slice than a given network operator. Um, And you can replicate that pretty much in every vertical or industry Um, because the giants of each of those industries understand better the connectivity needs that they have than the network operator. Um, And no doubt, each network operator, each group will probably specialize in a number of verticals in their market in which they have very close proximity with those industries. But it's unlikely that they will be able to create all the slices that will be necessary for all the use cases. Um, And the success becomes basically the ability to create um, the the capacity to uh, discover, uh, reserve uh, network capacity. Uh, and obviously that's not a manual process. Basically, we're talking about really cloudifying uh, the network infrastructure and opening a number of interfaces that would allow an industry to create their own slice on demand. Um, and obviously, again, uh, to do that, you need not only a cloud native environment, you need discoverability, you need uh, uh, a strong uh, management of resource uh, in near real time. You need a certain level of machine learning and capability to be able to arbitrate uh, maybe um, uh, resource constraint that might be uh, competing with each other and you need a high level of security. So a lot of that had been solved by cloud native and public cloud environments, but it's really now that we're seeing those two universes collapsing and and really 5G uh, is the first network that's probably more cloud than telecom uh, or will be. Uh, And I think that's a condition of success of our industry. Yeah, so thank you, Steve. Thank you, Patrick. Um, We are almost at time. Uh, I want to give uh, uh, give you guys one chance at any closing remarks, starting with uh, let's go to Rob. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Thomas. I think uh, I think it's loud and clear uh, that the the way the networks of the future are going to be built is, in my view, it's the ITification. So you will see a lot of softwareization, which is going to happen in the five G world, and it's going to be. The, the network has to be built, keeping in mind all the different use cases. We spoke about slice on demand, could be a industry vertical kind of use cases, B2C, B2B. Now, to keep that in mind, the networks has to be very, very agile, and they have to be very modular. You, we cannot have a vertical stack-based architectures. We have to go horizontal from bottoms up to top, and that's where the, 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 the networks have to evolve in the coming days. 
All right, perfect. And let's go to uh, let's go to Steve. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Horizontal architecture, absolutely critical. Otherwise, um, you will have a, a major issue of trying to get everybody to a common uh, a common uh, design point uh, in the in the in the um, in the architecture of the network. I think that's number one. I think the, the second thing is is understanding the leadership problem that comes along with that. And what I mean by leadership problem is actually thinking about how do you assemble the innovation act activities and also the operational activities between um, yourself as a service provider and the entire ecosystem. The supplier buyer mindset that has actually been very much prevalent in the industry has to you know simply go away, um, and we have to rethink about how do we engage with people to actually to drive desired outcomes. And those desired outcomes will mean operational workflows uh, have to be fully integrated. Uh, with 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 a, sorry between different vendors and between service providers and vendors as well because of the critical interdependency a lot of maturing to do there. Thank you, Steve and Patrick. Final remarks. Uh, yes, I think we see three main categories of operators out there in their behavior uh, when it comes to uh, those technologies. Uh, you have those that probably have the scale and the capacity to do it themselves uh, and they're looking for vendors and they're looking for partners, but they're going to integrate and they're going to create the operating model and uh, the architecture themselves. Um, then you have operators that maybe would like to do that um, and uh, would like to learn how to do that or understand that they might not have the resource or the skills today to do that at scale. Uh, and they ask for help uh, from companies like ourselves uh, to provide system uh, engineering and solution architecture capabilities, as well as system integrations capabilities. Um, and then there's a third category where operators, they're smaller usually, um, and they don't care about any of that. <laughs> they want to be able to deploy network without having to go through the plumbing and getting their hands dirty uh, under the hood, right? And I think it's really important to understand that um, probably those three categories will continue to exist. Um, and it's very important to be able, as a vendor, as a Steam system integrator, to address those three categories because they mean very different uh, setup from an architecture standpoint, from an operation standpoint. Uh, all of them surely require cloud nativeness, uh, uh, AI native capabilities, full automation, orchestration capabilities, but to different degrees, with different level of openness. And being able to achieve all of those um, is, a, is a key element for uh, any uh, company that wants to be successful in the 5G ecosystem. All right. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, so special thanks to uh, all of you who are tuning in and listening to this um, this broadcast. And a special thanks goes out to our panelists. Uh, so Steve, Gaurav, Patrick, um, appreciate you being here today. Appreciate you sharing your insights with us. And uh, hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas.